Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's public field hearing in New Orleans, Louisiana. At today's field hearing, you will hear from Director Richard Cordray. We hope a special local guest, she is on her way, as well as a panel of distinguished experts who will discuss the opportunities and challenges associated with mobile financial services. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or the CFPB, is an independent federal agency whose mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. My name is Ixta Martinez. I'm the Associate Director for External Affairs at the CFPB. Our audience today includes elected officials, community leaders, advocates, industry representatives, and of course, consumers. We are especially pleased to welcome Louisiana's Banking Commissioner, John Ducre, as well as bipartisan congressional staff from the offices of Representative Cedric Richmond and Representative Bill Cassidy. We're also honored to be joined by a representative of the Office of Louisiana's Attorney General, James Buddy Caldwell, whom you will be hearing from shortly. I'll spend just a few minutes telling you about what you can expect at today's field hearing. First, you'll hear welcoming remarks from Sinetria Sam Pleasant. She is the Director of Public Protection at the Louisiana Attorney General's Office. Then you'll hear from CFPB's Director, Richard Cordray. This will be followed by a panel discussion led by Daniel Dadramides, the CFPB's Assistant Director for the Office of Empowerment, who will be joined by Cheryl Parker Rose, the Assistant Director for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Following the panel discussion, there will be an opportunity to hear from the public. Today's field hearing is being live streamed at consumerfinance.gov, and you can also follow CFPB on Twitter and Facebook. So let's get started. We have with us a very special local guest. Her name is Sanitria Sam Pleasant. She's the Director of Public Protection with the Louisiana Attorney General's Office. She is a former criminal prosecutor. Please join me in welcoming Sanitria Sam Pleasant. I'm so grateful to be, have been given this opportunity to give you all a warm Louisiana welcome to our state and to the wonderful city of New Orleans, Louisiana. On behalf of Attorney General Buddy Caldwell, I'm Sam Pleasant, and I do want to apologize for Attorney General Caldwell that he was unable to be with you this morning and personally welcome you. So um, I have some blue suede shoes to fill. I don't know if you know, but our Attorney General um, he's a big fan of Elvis, and he often does impersonations and shows as Elvis. So um, I'm not wearing blue suede, but I'm going to try to fill those shoes for you this morning. It is so wonderful that the federal government and states can work together. I know in the past a lot of you realize that we've been at odds with one another, but this is a new era in terms of fairness, transparency, and also protection and accountability for actions. So it's really important that our local, state, and federal agencies continue to work together as a team. Buddy Caldwell likes to mention how he was a football player and a baseball player at Tulane University here in New Orleans, and he often views his staff as a team. And you would probably think as Attorney General that he is the coach, however, the constituents, the public, and our clients, the state of Louisiana is actually the coach, and Buddy is our quarterback. So we all work hand in hand to pass the ball, guard, and tackle, and um, get the ball moving in terms of protecting citizens, particularly of the state of Louisiana. And when needed, we do join with other agencies, such as this great agency, to um, protect the public, particularly in the financial and consumer-related areas. 
So at this point, I would, again, like to extend a warm welcome and let you know that you do have a friend, a partner, and a teammate in the state of Louisiana, and we look forward to our continued growing close relationship with one another to protect the citizens, not only of the state of Louisiana, but of the United States of America. Thanks. I am now pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role at the, <laughs> me. as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's attorney general. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion for Ohio's retirees, investors, and business owners, and took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as Attorney General, he also served as Ohio State Representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray. Thank you, Zixta. And it was a bit of an adventure getting here last night. A lot of thunder and lightning in Washington, D.C., but of course there's no more exciting destination anywhere in this country than to come to New Orleans. So glad to be here with you uh, today. And I'm glad to be joined uh, by, my, uh, by my colleagues, um, uh, the representative of Attorney General Caldwell, who was my colleague when I was the Attorney General in Ohio uh, before coming to the uh, Bureau. And he is a strong leader, as, as you say, for protecting citizens, not only in Louisiana, but through a lot of the work that the Attorney Generals do together uh, across the nation. And also, uh, Banking Commissioner uh, John Ducre, who I've come to know through a body in Washington known as the Financial Stability Oversight Council, uh, which I sit on and which he is involved with, uh, and is working to try to make sure that the financial system is safe and sound, and we don't go through the sort of tragedy and pain and dislocation that we've seen with the financial crisis just a few short years ago. Uh, so we're, we're all glad uh, from the Consumer Bureau to be in New Orleans today, a vibrant city of many different proud uh, cultures. And we're glad to be at the uh, former U.S. Mint. This is a historic location, and we're going to enjoy uh, getting a sense of uh, what financial services uh, and financial life was like uh, a century or more ago. As it's been said, this city is like a big musical gumbo. I'm sure that comment was mostly about its music, but I think it also applies to the great diversity we see here in New Orleans as well. That's important for us as we travel the country to raise awareness of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the work we're doing to help ensure that people are treated fairly in the financial marketplace. Understanding the diversity of consumers and learning all that we can about their lives helps us stay attuned to the needs and challenges they're facing. And by deepening our understanding of consumers, we're better able to conceptualize and prioritize our work. This is especially true when it comes to keeping up with how consumers are using technology. Perhaps no single aspect of life in America, I think those of us in, in this generation can appreciate this, uh, has changed more in the past generation than the relationship between people and their technological devices. Many of you have one in your hand as we speak. It's a fast-moving and exciting phenomenon, and more than any other aspect of our lives, it's creating the kind of gales of creative destruction that were first identified by the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter. Three-quarters of a century ago, he noted that human ingenuity is the true engine of economic activity, and that dynamic innovation will unpredictably upend the status quo in existing markets and bring disruptive change in its wake. If we consider his vision today, we see it playing out most vividly in how the information age is transforming leisure, the workplace, and indeed all of modern society. It's likewise inevitable that these changes will have vast consequences for the consumer financial marketplace. The worthy challenge for any system of financial regulation is how to make sure our oversight of the marketplace can keep up with these far-reaching shifts. We must grasp the pace and direction of fundamental change. And we have to understand and encourage the tremendous benefits of innovation without undermining the equally important goal of protecting consumers in the marketplace. Just consider how quickly the technological revolution is unfolding all around us. In the United States today, about 90% of adults now own a cell phone. I remember when that was a very unusual thing. 
they thus have ready mobile access to remote and instantaneous communications. A generation ago, hardly anyone did. Indeed, the first generations of Americans had no ability to engage in remote communications in real time by any means at all. To cite one notable local example, American soldiers fought and won the Battle of New Orleans more than two weeks after the United States and Great Britain had signed the Treaty of Ghent to end the War of 1812 because they were t entirely unaware that that had yet happened. In fact, hostilities continued for over a month before the combatants learned of the treaty and finally stood down. Today, they would have had the news just moments after it happened, even from halfway around the world, and we would never have had the great co country and western song by Johnny Horton. Consider also that in America today, almost 50 million people have tablets. We can easily carry them with us everywhere. For many people, they're a ubiquitous part of life, and they give us ready mobile access to information of all kinds. We keep up with the world through them. We read and view and hear the news. We reach out to friends and family by text. We take pictures and listen to music. And smartphones now represent a merging of these technologies. Last year, I finally made the conversion, after much prodding from my twins, from a flip phone to a smartphone. A little late, I know. Now all the answers to be found anywhere in the world are readily available at my fingertips or the sound of my voice. Look around any room, including this one, and you'll find that the single most knowledgeable thing in the room is no longer a human being, but any one of the smartphones in their pockets. One significant growth area for mobile devices has been in financial services. By accessing the internet, downloading certain applications, or using text messaging, people can now complete most of their transactions and a great deal of their financial management by using their phones and other mobile devices. Consumers are using their devices to pay bills online or send funds to other consumers or businesses. More and more, they're engaged in mobile banking, using their phones as tools to access their existing accounts at a bank or credit union or some other type of financial institution. One study by the Federal Reserve found that one-third of cell phone users and more than half of smartphone users are using mobile banking services. And according to one independent researcher, approximately 74,000 consumers per day began using mobile banking services last year. In this modern age where people can manage their money on the go, there's a great potential to provide access to more consumers and allow them to take greater control of their financial lives. At the same time, using mobile devices for all sorts of banking services can make some transactions cheaper or faster or both. But we need to make sure that the legal and regulatory framework can keep up effectively so that all consumers can remain protected whether they're opening their wallet or scanning the screen on their smartphone. Our colleagues at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the Federal Reserve have already done laudable work in this area. Both have taken important steps to address the subject of mobile banking. Today, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is issuing a formal request for information that touches on a wide array of issues related to mobile banking and financial management services. We want to know more about how emerging technologies are affecting the opportunities and challenges that consumers are facing. The inquiry also specifically addresses how the use of mobile payment products can be used to improve the financial lives of underserved consumers. We have identified two areas of opportunities for consumers that we want to know more about. First, we're exploring the ways mobile devices can give access to consumers who do not have easy means to obtain or use current financial products or services. Second, we want to know how mobile devices can offer everyone opportunities for real-time money management. Ensuring access to financial products and services is a key focus for us at the Consumer Bureau. We've learned from the FDIC's research into the difficulties experienced by those who are either unbanked or underbanked. Tens of millions of Americans fall into these two categories. They face costly challenges to complete day-to-day -day transactions that those in the mainstream financial system take for granted. Our inquiry here will focus on an even broader category of consumers who are underserved. They are hardworking people living from paycheck to paycheck and waging a constant struggle to make ends meet. They often are younger. They may be older. They may also face particular accessibility issues, such as consumers who are disabled or live in certain areas. Often people may be underserved through no choice of their own. For example, they may live in a rural area where no bank branches are located and where alternative financial services may also be in short supply. And as certain neighborhoods of New Orleans know all too well, sometimes banks just do not want to establish or maintain branches in particular areas. 
So even if you are a good candidate for a bank account or a loan, if you live in a poor or more remote neighborhood, it can be hard to access the financial services you need. The result is that underserved consumers tend to pay higher rates for services such as payday loans or check cashing. A recent FDIC study found that the anytime, anyplace nature of mobile financial services offers the potential to help more people gain easier access to the banking system and grow their financial capability. Mobile phones are quite prevalent among many of these consumers who may use these devices in lieu of computers. For example, in households earning less than $25,000 a year, 74% of adults have a mobile phone of some type and 44% have a smartphone. Mobile financial services can help provide access to a myriad of products and services that these consumers may not be able to access due to location or other barriers such as cost. The cost issue is important because mobile has the potential to be significantly cheaper than traditional banking. One industry report calculated that the average cost of an in-branch transaction was $4.25 whereas the average cost of a mobile transaction was just 10 cents. These are significant cost savings, much of which can and should be passed on to consumers. Other categories of consumers also stand to benefit from the emerging technologies of mobile financial services. These populations include older Americans and the disabled. My father happens to fall into both categories, as he is 96 years old now and legally blind. The ability to conduct transactions remotely without having to travel anywhere can be enormously liberating in these circumstances. The second great opportunity we see with emerging mobile technologies is an opportunity for everyone to manage their money better. Mobile devices can present faster and easier ways to access products, track spending, and manage accounts. So they can make it much easier to do real-time money management. For example, you can check your account balance while you're out shopping to make sure you can afford to make your purchases. You can transfer money from your savings account to your checking account so that when your mortgage payment is debited, you have enough money in the right account. You can take a picture of a check and deposit it electronically into your bank account without having to go to a branch. According to a 2013 survey by the Federal Reserve Board, a quarter of smartphone users have used their phone to track purchases and expenses during the prior year. The same survey found that 69% of mobile banking users said they checked their account balance before making a large purchase, and half of them decided not to make the purchase once they became aware of their account balance or credit limit. We want to know more about how these services help consumers and how they could do so even more effectively. Arming consumers with better and more current information about their accounts helps them make wiser use of their funds and avoid costly penalty fees. With all of these groups of underserved consumers, technology has great potential to improve people's lives. Implemented with the right type of protections, mobile financial services can fill in various gaps that now exist. In today's request for information, we're seeking more information about how these services can be used to empower and address the financial needs of consumers in safe and affordable ways. While we see so many opportunities for mobile financial services, we also need to be aware of the challenges and risks. Challenges that we highlight in the request for information are customer service and security and privacy. Customer service is a concern because it may be harder to know whom to talk to or where to find information when using a mobile financial product or service leads to an error or mishap. If a consumer loses her smartphone or has her service disrupted, she may not have access to a bank branch or a computer. In these circumstances, what kind of assistance will be available? Will the consumer have anywhere to call for help? Will she be able to reach someone who can and will provide the help she needs? These are important questions that need good answers so that consumers will not be left in the lurch if something goes wrong. Another challenge in the evolution and growth of mobile financial services involves concerns about security and privacy. According to a March report by the Federal Reserve, a major factor limiting consumer adoption of mobile banking and mobile payments is the belief by some that these services do not offer any added value over existing methods. The study highlights the point that mobile has great potential value. It found that as smartphones become more common and more versatile, mobile technology may empower consumers and expand access to financial services for underserved populations. But the study found that the other major factors limiting consumer adoption of mobile banking and mobile payments were concerns about security and privacy. The study did not try to explain away these concerns, instead warning that consumers will have to weigh for themselves the benefits and risks that these services pose to their security and privacy. 
Underserved consumers who use a mobile device to conduct their financial transactions may pace, face particular privacy concerns. It's critical that they be able to protect their personal financial information, but if their device gets stolen, all of this information could be endangered. So we're seeking information on any additional protections that consumers may need when they lose their device or if they lose access to service on their device. We're also seeking to learn more about the kinds of information companies are collecting on consumers, whether that's being disclosed to consumers and how the information is being used for low-income consumers in particular. For example, we want to know if low-income consumers are getting the benefits of better priced products. And we want to know if providers are using their data to target them for higher cost products, which would keep these consumers stuck in the same vicious cycle of tricks and traps that the Consumer Bureau is working hard to stamp out in the consumer financial marketplace. In addition, we're exploring whether data breaches are more common on mobile devices as compared to traditional computers. We also want to know how consumer use may be inhibited by these security issues and how it may affect wider adoption of financial products and services. On all of these issues, we're seeking your perspective at today's field hearing, and we will solicit public feedback through the more formal process that I've already described. In these ways, you will help us decide how we should focus our efforts to better serve and protect consumers. As New Orleans native Wynnon Marsalis once said, we always hear about the rights of democracy, but the major responsibility of it is participation. So we hope that as many people as possible will take part by responding to our request for information. In the meantime, consumers should take all the necessary precautions when they use their mobile devices to do their banking or conduct financial transactions. On this point, today we're issuing helpful tips for users of mobile banking and mobile financial services. These include tips on protecting your personal information, using strong passwords, and alerting your financial provider immediately when your phone is lost or stolen. Also, do not forget to use secure websites, apps, and hardware, and make sure to log out of the browser when you're done. When using free or public Wi-Fi, try to use a private network and go to a secure site that begins with HTTPS. Most of this advice is common sense, but it's always good to be reminded. You can also go to Ask CFPB on our website at consumerfinance.gov to find out more. At the Consumer Bureau, we now oversee all consumer financial markets ranging from mortgages to bank accounts to credit cards to student loans and many more as well. These markets are worth trillions of dollars and there's no doubt that mobile will continue to play an increasingly important role in how they serve consumers. The job of our new agency is to do all we can to ensure that financial products and services actually are helping consumers rather than harming them. And that's why we look forward to a frank discussion of these issues today. Thank you. At this time, I'd like uh, the panelists to please take their place on stage. And while they're doing so, I'm going to introduce them. The staff panelists include Daniel Dodd Ramirez. He is the Assistant Director for the Office of Empowerment, as well as Cheryl Parker Rose. She's the Assistant Director for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Guest panelists include Steve Strait, CEO of Green Dot, Ed Sivak, Chief Policy and Communications Officer with the Hope Enterprise Corporation, Josh Reich, CEO of Simple, Carolina Hernandez, Executive Director, Puentes, New Orleans. Reverend Dr. Willie Gable, Pastor of the Progressive Baptist Church in New Orleans. And Joe Valenti, Director of Asset Building with the Center of American Progress. Daniel, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Daniel Dodd Ramirez. I am the Assistant Director for the Office of Financial Empowerment at the CFPB. This is the part of the CFPB that focuses on low income and economically vulnerable people. Uh, we estimate that this includes as many as 100 million people who are either at below um, twice the poverty level, um, who are either at or at below twice the poverty level. Many of these are unbanked or underbanked, as Director Cordray mentioned, have thin or no credit files, have little or no savings, or otherwise do not have access to affordable credit and financial services. We want to go into the world of mobile with our eyes open, but we also want to explore the potential that this has for consumers, and potential to make it cheaper 
faster, and more convenient for everyone. In particular, it can provide benefits for the low-income and underserved. It can help low-income consumers to access and manage safe and affordable products and services, which it can help them to move up the economic mobility ladder to measurably improve their financial lives. Mobile also has the potential to save consumers time. Time is especially valuable, especially precious for low-income families that may be without reliable transportation, or they may live far away from a financial institution, or they are trying to manage multiple jobs and household responsibilities. We would like to help consumers navigate the mobile fi marketplace. Financial services and products are complicated enough as it is. And as Director Cordroy has said, the use of mobile devices for financial services um, it really is a, an area of growth in this country. Today we're going to explore these issues here in New Orleans from the industry and from the consumer perspective. We want to learn what the opportunities are and how to access them, um, and also how to gauge the risks and how to address those risks. We have a wonderful panel here today, and we'll continue the discussion with them. Um, we're going to ask each of our panelists to offer brief remarks initially, and then we're going to have some facilitated discussion here on the stage. So why don't we start with um, Steve, and then we'll go sure. right down the line, and then <coughs> afterwards we'll go over to Carolina and go down the line. Thank you very much. And in the spirit of the uh, session, I've made all re my remarks on a mobile phone, an old one, <laughs> but a mobile phone nonetheless, <laughs> so I don't have any paper in front of me. So uh, my name is Steve Street, and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Green Dot Corporation. Uh, Green Dot is a bank holding company, which is regulated by the Federal Reserve and our bank subsidiary in the holding company, also regulated by the state of Utah, uh, DFI. Our mission as a company is reinventing personal banking for the masses. That's the mission you'd see painted on our walls and on all of our letterhead. And uh, the way we started uh, life was about 14 years ago as a startup, and we're credited with inventing the reloadable prepaid debit card industry, which was sort of our, our thing way back when, and, uh, and also uh, the reload network that uh, services those cards so you can put money onto those bank accounts. Uh, we also now have a product called GoBank, which is a mobile checking and savings account product that uh, those of you in the industry may know about. Uh, most of our products are sold under the brand names of Green Dot at 92,000 retailers uh, coast to coast. We also uh, sell uh, the cards under the Walmart money card brand name, and then our checking account and savings accounts under the GoBank uh, brand. And we also view ourselves at Green Dot as a consumer advocacy, which is uh, not common necessarily, to be honest with you, in, in our industry. Uh, but we work quite a bit with uh, advocates who we uh, trust and respect and uh, other stakeholders because we care a lot about our, about our consumers. Every product we have is focused exclusively on low and moderate income Americans. We don't serve any other constituency but that. So as a bank and a bank holding company, uh, all the products we design, the fee schedules, and the way we think about who will use the product is tailored uh, to that particular constituency, constituency, which is no small niche. Uh, I had somebody say to me, well, that's a pretty niche business, isn't it? I said, no, it's uh, two-thirds of the country. If you think of American households earning less than $75,000 a year or less than $50,000 a year, it is the vast majority of Americans, uh, not the minority of Americans, and so it's a, a niche that's big and one we enjoy serving. And so that's uh, uh, the background of Green Dot, and we're honored to be invited to uh, speak here today. Um, well, thank you, um, Director Cordray, members of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, and members of the audience. Thank you for holding the hearing today in our region um, and on the important topic of mobile financial services. Uh, my name is Ed Sebeck, and I'm the Chief Policy and Communications Officer for Hope Enterprise Corporation. Uh, Hope is a nonprofit community development finance institution uh, that also sponsors Hope Federal Credit Union. For 20 years, we've worked to break the cycle of poverty throughout Louisiana and the Mid-South by undertaking a wide range of income and asset development strategies. I want to talk about two things in my brief remarks. The first is about expanding access to financial services for consumers. It's important to know that in this historically underserved uh, region, um, a couple of uh, statistics. So the first is that Mississippi and Arkansas are the most unbanked and second most underbanked uh, states in the country. This is according to the FDIC. And at the same time, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention reports that Mississippi and Arkansas have the second and third highest percentage of wireless only households in the nation. One out of two households in Arkansas, one out of two in Mississippi, 
only have a wireless phone. And while one perspective may be that of challenge, we see them as a great opportunity. In December of 2012, Hope made the strategic decision to significantly upgrade and expand our mobile service platform. Since the upgrade, over 3,500 users have signed up for mobile banking. Over half of these users live in communities where the poverty rate exceeds 20%. Finally, while most mobile banking users live in markets where Hope has a retail presence, a not insignificant number of users live in rural communities throughout the region where Hope does not have a branch. Many of our users are using this for real-time money management. Far and away, the most actively used feature on our mobile platform includes that of checking one's balance. The frequency with which one checks their balance actually is three to four times as large as the next most used feature, which is to view and make internal transfers from one account to another. One lesson learned from analyzing these data is that HOPE members are using their mobile devices to manage their money and that they need real-time information. While our online banking system distinguishes between the current balance, the amount of money that is in the account when the day begins following the posting of the previous day's transactions, the available balance is not present on our mobile service platform. This subtracts pending transactions from the current balance and is actually a more accurate representation of what's available for withdrawal. Um, we are currently developing an application which will provide the not only the current balance but the available balance and that is something that needs to be considered as the Bureau looks at uh, mobile financial services. Uh, we're also um, developing a personal finance manager w which will roll out this fall. It incorporates bubbles that vary by size and by color to alert members as to whether or not they are spending on budget or whether they've exceeded their budget on certain areas. Uh, this, we believe, combined with our services, will greatly enhance the information available to our members, not just to manage their money, but to ultimately save and move up the economic ladder. Um, in closing, I do want to caveat my comments today with an important distinction. Mobile financial services, particularly in reference to serving unbanked and underbanked households, are an enhancement to, not a replacement for, a vibrant, effective, and innovative network of financial access points staffed by people who are committed to the community. In the absence of our network of branches and our strategic partnerships, I would not have the numbers on which to base this testimony today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to your questions. So uh, thank you, Director Cordray, everyone at the CFPB and the audience for hosting me here today. Uh, in New Orleans. Uh, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and one that I'm very delighted to speak about. So I'm Josh Reich, the co-founder and CEO of Simple. Uh, Simple is a branchless banking service um, that provides our customers with a very um, modern lifestyle-oriented approach to interacting with their financial services. We give our customers really excellent web and mobile tools coupled with a very personal level of customer service when they need that. Um, and our customers absolutely love the combined package that we offer them. In the context of today's discussion, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, the simple mobile banking application um, is the highest rated banking application in both the Android and Apple app stores. And we've done this despite having a team that's a fraction of the size of the incumbents. And we believe what's really underpinning our success is our founding philosophy. So Director Cordray mentioned in his opening remarks uh, Schumpeter, and we believe um, that the majority of banks uh, rely on an unsustainable information asymmetry um, that leaves an industry ripe for creative destruction. Fundamentally, uh, we believe that banks make money by keeping their customers confused. Um, <laughs> we try to operate at the intersection of technology, user experience, design, and behavioral finance to restore the balance. We want to give uh, customers the tools that they need to have insight and control over their financial lives. And that's what they really deserve. So since we brought in our first customers about two years ago, our common sense approach has had a really dramatic impact on our customers' abilities to uh, spend smarter and save more. For example, our customers set aside 30% of their balances uh, towards future purchases, and this is a dramatic um, comparison to a national savings rate that is less than 5%. This is really empowered by our goals feature, which is designed for how people think rather than how banks work. We recognize that modern consumers carry two things in their wallets, or in their pockets, their phones and their wallets. 
instead of customers making customers do mental arithmetic and giving them a, you know, the current balance, Simple provides um, or Simple leverages mobile as a means to provide them with what we call a safe to spend balance that immediately tells them how much they can safely spend today without hurting themselves tomorrow. And there's a real time metric that takes into account how much money they have, how much money is coming in and what they'd like to achieve with their future goals. So if a customer wants to buy a new coat, um, they can simply open up the mobile app and we can make it easy for them to create a goal uh, that will offset the future financial impact of that purchase um, while decreasing their overall uh, vi uh, volatility of their cash flow. So by eschewing traditional revenue sources of unnecessary overdraft fees and driving consumers into debt, we're free to design a service that never profits from customer confusion. And at the end of the day, this leaves our customers happier. And this happiness is reflected in the fact that most of our customers arrive at Simple through word of mouth. And that's a rare phenomenon in a world of glitzy and often unethical bank advertising. And it's something that we're proud of and it's something that fuels our growth. Um, so we're just into an exciting phase at Simple with our acquisition by BBVA. This new partnership gives us access to a wider portfolio of financial products so we can expand our philosophy from just a checking and savings account um, into improving people's relationship with their money in a way that fits naturally with their digital and mobile lifestyle. Carolina. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Carolina Hernandez. I'm the executive director of Puentes, New Orleans. Um, born and raised here in, in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, Puentes, New Orleans was created in 2007. We were created basically to serve the Latino community. I've been a board member of Puentes since 2008, and I just recently transferred into the position of executive director. We create access to assets for the Latino community and with the Latino community. We do that through leadership development, civic engagement, economic asset building, and policy and advocacy. Today I want to talk about uh, the work that we do around economic asset building. We do that through two different programs. We try to get Latinos into homes as first time homeowners and we're currently doing that with a holistic approach of making sure that they understand uh, how to manage credit, how to manage their finances. Um, we have a great mentor right now. Uh, the Neighborhood Development Foundation here in New Orleans is mentoring us so that we can become HUD certified and serve the Latino community in this area. Additionally, and more importantly, we're doing also economic asset building through our small business program. And we've partnered through Accio with Acción Louisiana, which is one of the m largest micro lenders in the country. And we've had to, this partnership with Acción grew out of this need to service Latinos that just weren't bankable and don't have the n knowledge or the skills or just are lost in the systems of financing. And a lot of that confusion is around language access. And I wanna hone in this one point about language access as an example. Home Depot and Walmart figured it out really quickly that without addressing language access, not just for Latinos, but for all limited English proficient communities, it hurts your pocketbook. And so I ask that when you're thinking about consumers, you think about limited English proficient communities like the Latino community here in New Orleans. We advocate for them to learn English, but they are a uh, financial machine and they all earn lots of money and they can spend it and they can save it and they can invest it. And as an organization, we are trying to um, educate them, empower them so they can do all those things. Um, but it would make our job easier if uh, more companies understood the need and the sensitivity culturally to address the needs of limited English proficient communities. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Willie Gable. I'm the uh, pastor of Progressive Baptist Church, uh, a member of the Center for Responsible Lending, uh, faith-based uh, roundtable, and the Louisiana Coalition for Responsible Lending. First of all, we'd like to thank the director and the CFPB staff for their commitment to these field hearings and uh, for graciously hosting us, and I hope that we've hosted you as well as you've hosted us in your offices and the work that uh, you've been doing. Uh, the Center for Responsible Lending and the Louisiana Coalition, though we focus primarily 
on predatory lending, payday lenders, and um, consolidated debt. We were concerned about uh, consumer protection in terms of financing in all areas, uh, particularly in this area of mobile banking. Uh, online banking has been around, but uh, mobile banking has not reached the masses of those in our particular context yet. Uh, the challenge has been uh, the information being readily available and the education that's necessary to be provided to the members of our context in terms of the importance of using mobile banks. Uh, we think that, that there's great opportunity for mobile banking uh, for our context, for those in low income areas, but we believe marginal education, uh, constituents with marginal education, it's important that we provide some context for them to learn and to operate and to use uh, mobile banking. One of the great opportunities, however, uh, that we do see on the horizon, and that is those who, and we've watched this um, nationally through our National Baptist, but all through other faith-based coalitions, that those young people, we find those young people who are five, six, seven years old, who have smartphones now, uh, though it's a challenge right now, even with the marginal education in the future, they all will be using mobile banking. That's a fact that we, we see. And uh, to that end, uh, the faith community is attempting now to gear up to not only fill the gap with those uh, individual seniors, uh, as Director Cordray said, and those right now with marginal education, uh, to assist them in understanding how to utilize uh, the bank, uh, the mobile bank, but also to create opportunity through uh, financial literacy programs, which we have in our uh, churches to assist the upcoming generation of young people and young adults in uh, utilizing this opportunity. So we look forward to the discussion uh, that is um, to ensue, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get some great answers. Good morning. I'd like to thank Director Cordray and the CFPB for inviting me to speak here today about mobile banking. My name is Joe Valenti. I'm the Director of Asset Building at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., and my work focuses primarily on policies that expand access to the financial system for low and moderate income Americans. And I do believe mobile banking can be a successful approach to reach the underserved if done right. First, a few statistics. Approximately 28% of American households either lack bank accounts, a group known as the unbanked, or are underbanked, meaning that they have accounts but are not fully integrated in the financial system. Instead, they're relying on non-bank financial services managing their money by going to check cashers, purchasing money orders, paying bills in person. And here in Louisiana, those numbers are, are far higher. 42% of households are either unbanked or underbanked, including over 200,000 households in the state that don't have bank accounts at all. At the same time, cell phone availability has increased dramatically over the past decade. And I know Ed already pointed out some of the CDC statistics. We're at the point where more Louisianans have cell phones, 91% then have bank accounts. And in a report that we released last year, we pointed out that this makes Louisiana one of seven states and the District of Columbia in which cell phones are more prevalent than bank accounts for adults. Based on new data about cell phone ownership, this is uh, now increased to nine states <coughs> in DC, including several states in the Gulf region. As traditional banking has become less accessible and convenient due to branch closings and other nationwide trends, Mobile banking is an opportunity for consumers to better manage their money without needing to rely on bank branches. Perhaps the most significant development is remote deposit capture, the ability to deposit a check just by taking a photo of it with your smartphone camera. This step alone can effectively give, can effectively give millions of consumers who currently rely on check cashers a raise, saving anywhere from two to 5% or more in check cashing fees. Smartphones continue to become more popular and are already the majority of cell phones in use in the US. And as a result, we'll likely see more innovations that enable consumers to manage money on their phones in the coming years. But this doesn't mean consumers without smartphones are necessarily left out. Even on a traditional cell phone, text alerts can provide balance information and reminders 
to help consumers avoid overdraft fees when balances are low. And that's an important tool when the median overdraft fee nationally is now $35. And one pilot in Philadelphia has taken text alerts one step further. Consumers receiving credit counseling have a new option, and I will repeat, this is only an option, to hold themselves accountable for paying down debt. If they miss a payment, their family and friends can receive text alerts too. <laughs> so there is no shortage of creativity in the development of mobile banking tools. I think the question is how we uh, manage this creativity and make sure that it uh, is best harnessed to reach the people uh, that it needs to reach. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. I'll start with the first question. It'll be to um, Reverend Dr. Gable. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing in the community with respect to access to financial services? Well, one of the things that we we see is that certainly in terms of, and I think the, the director sort of uh, touched on that, in certain communities they do not have access to facilities uh, because banks are not readily available there, uh, particularly in the context of New Orleans. Uh, but certainly what we also understand is that many now are moving to mobile banking. And uh, one of the things that we were, uh, and our background of research that was interesting, it's when one, if a consumer is directed to use the mobile device, we find that even those with marginal education and low income will use that. And uh, the case I cite is those receiving SSI. Because SSI require, or does not require, but offers them an opportunity to manage their social security uh, checks on an app, what we have found in Louisiana is that they are actually using that app to manage their money rather than uh, the banks. And so th and when the opportunity presents itself and it's provided to them in a manner whereby they understand it, they utilize it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next question is for, for Ed. Um, it was interesting, Ed, what you said about the frequency of how people are checking their balances and actually transferring money from one m account to another. How are you using um, you know, mobile financial services to reach consumers, particularly um, those that are in underserved communities? And in particular, how are you introducing um, consumers to these services? Sure. Um, so by way of example, um, uh, it starts with building a trusted relationship. I mean, it, it, like any work in community, if, if you don't have that first level of trust, you're not going to have penetration with, with the product. So, for example, um, our branch manager in Biloxi uh, will go over to the Gulf Coast Community Action Agency in, in Gulfport. Uh, that may be 35-minute drive. Mm -hmm. And so she'll work with the um, staff there and uh, introduce them to um, the HOPE, but also say, you know, you don't have to drive all the way over to Biloxi to conduct most of your financial transactions. You can check your balance, you can deposit a check, you can engage in these services. Um, when that relationship is built <coughs> up, that's when you see people starting to adopt the, um, the service. And, and I think that goes back to my point of that um, it begins with having people who are active in community who have relationships built on trust. And I also think it, it includes having an understanding of, of the issues that are facing low-income consumers. Um, we still have many consumers who will come into, many members who will come into our branch after they receive their check through direct deposit and withdraw almost the entire balance. And when you talk to them about why they're doing that, what, they'll, what we learn is, you know, for example, um, if they tried to pay their rent and that rent check bounced, that landlord may no longer accept a check. And so they've got to pay their rent in cash. And so I think having these, um, this grounding of the realities they're facing low income consumers as we're developing these products and building the trust is how we reach them and, um, and enhance the um, use of this application. Thank you. Thanks. Josh, my question is to you and I'm also going to have a follow on to, to the, the first part of it. What goals are your users most interested in and what do they find most helpful? Is it 
real-time savings information? Is it building up a savings balance? And the follow-on question is, have you added features as a result of consumer demand and interest? Sure. Um, so I think at the end of the day, uh, customers, really our customers and everyone's customers, want to worry less about money, and that concern manifests itself in multiple different ways. Um, people turn to the simple application because uh, we're known for the, the features that you've mentioned, like real-time access to your information and gold saving. Um, but the, 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 cu the, the way people worry about money is presented money in many ways, and one of the things that we really pride ourselves on, I think, leads to um, sort of the brand that we're building is the way we listen to consumers. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the marketplace and the competing offerings from larger banks, they provide very rudimentary functionality, and we think there's a very wide field for innovation. So what we like to do is we like to have sort of three pillars to our culture of continuous innovation. One is high bandwidth communication from customers. We believe in providing a real human level of customer service, not only so that you have that interaction, but so that we're listening and internalizing where we need to do our innovation next. We also like to provide our employees with a great deal of agency to solve problems and respond quickly. And we like to have a culture where we are transparent and trusting of each other. Um, this allows us uh, to, I think to the second part of the question, um, continually iterate on the, the things that we build. Um, technology allows you to hear from a customer and within weeks have a solution in their hands. Um, that would be very difficult to do in a traditional branch network or in a traditional organization. And mobile and technology in general is one way of making that happen. Thank you. Next question is for, for Catalina Hernandez. So Catalina, you talked about some of the barriers that are around um, limited English proficiency challenges earlier. Um, what other barriers do you underserved communities face in the financial services marketplace? And the follow-on to that is, um, could the increasing prevalence of mobile financial um, service devices help to address some of those issues? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, although the United States is ever more closer to a majority-minority status, uh, new, new research noted in a study recently released by the National Council of La Raza, the National Urban League, and the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development indicates that communities of color face considerable challenges in meeting their needs in today's financial services marketplace. The report focused in places with large communities of color, for example, Ch Chicago, Houston, and Southern Florida. Findings showed many commonalities across all these communities surveyed. For example, although 81% reported they have either a basic checking or savings account, 42% said they had no idea how to raise money in to cover a major financial emergency. Indicating they are low in savings, um, which indicates they are low in savings, also nearly 20% remain unbanked and are outside the financial formal economy which they rely on alternative financial services, which we've all discussed today, such as payday loans and pawn shops. They also prefer the bank in person uh, rather than using online services. And that goes back to just being culturally relevant. Um, even though they most, most of them own smartphones and they own smartphones primarily because they <coughs> want to communicate to their families outside of the country, um, so they need World Connect phones uh, they prefer positive, culturally relevant customer service at, at physical branches. And many indicated um, that they turned to friends and family for advice around finances, and only 13% had ever used a professional finance advice advisor. Access and relevant access must be addressed by today's financial services industry. They should work to increase the banked and financially engaged populations in communities of color, and small dollar lending should be increased by financial institutions as an alternative to payday loans. And policymakers should take steps to expand programs um, that are culturally relevant and that have been proven to succeed in other uh, communities. I also want to uh, bring up the need for addressing the needs of the undocumented. Uh, the undocumented um, in our situation here in New Orleans are a strong economic force, but you wouldn't know it because they don't put any of their money in the bank. And so we encourage them over and over again to um, 
go with the IRS and get an I-10 number so that they can um, not only bank, but they can also pay taxes. Many of them do that already, but don't bank. And they don't bank because they don't trust banks. And uh, so they'd rather put the money in some hidden spot in their home. So if they're not banking, then mobile banking is irrelevant. And, um, and they all have smartphones. So it's a gap that is not an easy one to find a solution for. Um, and one of the things that we're doing at Puentes is that we've decided to create a series of free workshops on a monthly basis to just run down the basics of what it is to bank, what it is to take out an ITIN number, and to ease their concerns about banking. And we do know through our home ownership program and primarily our small business program, it takes a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. An information session is just the beginning of that conversation. And we do a lot of free technical assistance with every <coughs> single person that comes through our doors because if we don't do it that way, they will not follow through. Um, they have very few examples in their circle of family and friends. Um, so therefore, even though I'm Latina and I'm from New Orleans and I can speak to them in a culturally relevant way, uh, that isn't always enough to convince them. And so I emphasize again the need to consider all the services and products that are developed and produced and particularly policy that is uh, designed to address services and products that they take into account that cultural relevance that is needed. And it's hard to measure, um, but there are groups like, my, like Puentes, like ourselves, and other groups throughout the country who are doing it. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Steve Strait with Green Dot. Yeah. So Steve, it <coughs> seems as though we are developing a narrative which shows that use of mobile financial services and products could be a game changer for consumers. And if that is the case, if that is the case, I'm curious, what has surprised you the most about how consumers are using their financial, their mobile financial services? Well, it's a good question. Uh, um, and first of all, when we talk about mobile banking, I'm not even sure our customers would respond if we asked them that. If, in other words, if you were in a focus group and you said, hey, everybody, you do mobile banking, I think you'd have a lot of confused look, uh, looks. If you said how many people uh, access their bank account information online, everybody would raise their hand. And uh, the, the fact that a mobile app is an app is something internal to people who work in technology. The consumer just thinks about it as going online. And they go online with whatever internet appliance is nearest to them. And it could be a Samsung tablet, it could be a, a Galaxy 3 or like whatever it is that Josh is using, it could be whatever <laughs> else it is, you know. And, uh, uh, and they just want to access that information as quickly as possible. So they're not thinking about banking in terms of mobile versus online any more than you may have watched uh, CNN or something flying in, but you may not remember if you saw it in an airport TV, the back seat of a JetBlue airplane, or your home flat panel, all you remember is the content, content is king. In banking, it's the same thing, content is king. The fact that you happen to access it more easily on a mobile device is just the fact that broadband is more present and more people have mobile devices. So anyhow, uh, uh, that's a weird answer to your question, but that's one of them. And the reason that's surprising is when you launch a, um, website that is easily viewed on a mobile device, you just see the usage of it skyrocket. Uh, of more than half of all, and we do millions of online hits or whatever you call it, to people who get their account information on the Green Dot website. Um, now half of that is all on a mobile appliance. But if you were to ask that customer if you're doing mobile banking, they would not respond to that. If you said, do you ever use Green Dot online? Oh yeah, all the time. And then if you said, well, do you have that at a home computer or desktop? It, well, no, I just, this is my internet. I just go online here. What's interesting about low-income Americans is that that is their online appliance of choice, and that's why you see the proliferation of uh, smartphones with lower-income people. If you are higher income, you have a desktop at home maybe. Maybe you have a big Apple uh, thing you use for graphic design in another room of the house. Uh, maybe this, maybe that, and then you have that uh, phone. If you're a low-income uh, person, that Samsung or that uh, prepaid phone with uh, 
a straight talk phone from Walmart, which is extremely popular. That is everything. That's how you make a call. It's how you text. It's how you do your homework. It's how you do your research. It's how you book a, an airline ticket on southwest.com. And it's also going to be the way you get your account information on your bank account. But they wouldn't consider it mobile banking. It's just the world of the Internet. So we do have apps, uh, but increasingly uh, most of our investment goes just into having a great online site that is easily read from a small screen, uh, for lack of a better – if my technology folks were here, they'd be cringing. I'm sure I'm explaining it <laughs> wrong. <laughs> but that's essentially it. And if you think about how you use Internet services, you're probably nodding, thinking, yeah, I just go to whatever's nearby. And if I'm in the kitchen, maybe it's an iPad. If I'm in my office, maybe it's a desktop. But it's still that Internet site. So, but that's what's been most amazing to me is how readily people adopt mobile technology for anything and everything you'd ever do, not because they view themselves as techies or, or wizards or anything like that, just because it's the nearest thing you have near you to get your information. And the, the nearer and faster always wins. It always has in life and it always will. And mobile is just the latest incarnation of that. So, but anyway, that's been the biggest surprise. So, Joe, you spoke about some of the opportunities. Um, do you see any potential risks for consumers from mobile financial services? So there are three risks. The first is I'm actually going to borrow Steve's content as king piece and say that the disclosure tools that we currently offer on paper, the disclosures that <coughs> consumer advocates have always felt so strongly about, don't always carry over to the mobile environment. And one really good example is the credit card reform that Congress passed in 2009 which mandated that on all of your paper statements, the credit, the credit card company needs to tell you how much you have to pay each month in order to be debt free in three years. And uh, recent analysis showed that this one provision on the statement saved consumers $71 million a year just by giving them this guideline. Unfortunately, at least a third of all Americans don't get their credit card bills in paper form. Uh, they handle their credit card bills uh, online or um, on mobile. So they're missing this information. And consumer disclosures must really be adapted for the mobile tools. Having the uh, funny looking QR codes and having web links isn't really going to suffice, but it's also an effort to make it understandable, again, to deal with this small screen issue. Second, I think we have to deal with data security, both perceived threats and real. There's no clear chain of responsibility when mobile financial products fail, whether it's with the device or the network or the bank or even which regulator is in play. And about 40% of all consumers surveyed by the Federal Reserve have reported they're just not sure whether mobile banking is safe or not. And I think having a clear way to address this risk and to clear up this risk would uh, be a major step forward. Consumers should not be liable for unauthorized charges, and they should be able to safeguard their data if their device is lost or stolen. And then the third risk is we have to be sure that mobile banking products are banking products first and not the other way around, that they're based on underlying regulated and insured devices. Those may be checking accounts. Those may be uh, green dot prepaid cards or other prepaid cards that are out there in the marketplace. But they need to be regulated and insured products. No killer app should be circumventing regulations if our objective is to expand access and build trust. Instead, mobile financial tools should be building off the regulatory platforms that are already in place to make sure that we can protect consumers from abusive practices. Thank you. It's been a great conversation. We have one final question for all the panelists, and we'll get started with um, Carolina and then just go down the line. Um, I'd like to hear from you all what you think the opportunities are for the use of mobile financial services in reaching the underserved? Basically, the, the way I see it is the opportunity is that most of the families um, that we serve in low-income communities and immigrant uh, communities don't have a computer or a laptop or a tablet. So the only thing they have is that smartphone. And so if there's a way to figure out how to uh, get them more comfortable in using mobile banking or some sort of finance mobile service, um, I think that would be a huge win for everyone. And doing it relevant to them culturally and in their language is one way to do that. 
And I agree. I think that um, for our context and for our community, uh, the opportunities are grand and, and uh, glorious. Uh, and I would uh, suggest that uh, there would be a massive .gov educational push, a, a major PSA program that comes out on the um, uh, you know, TV, the, the, the cable, that speaks to uh, this issue uh, and, and, and sort of you know, gear the individuals and instruct them to explore. Now, this is once vetting the process has all has been stated and, and making sure that we have it in a nice way. But I think that's one thing that we can have that, and that certainly will help the churches because as we continue with our financial literacy programs and as you produce the, the information that we provide, uh, we can actually do the hands-on. But uh, I think a massive PSA program will, would certainly help. I would agree about the opportunities, and I think there are two important and overlapping uh, groups that mobile is particularly well suited for. One is people, uh, as we've discussed, who may not have banks available in their communities. The other is for people who just don't like banks or don't want to deal with banks. And if you look at the FDIC numbers of who is unbanked and underbanked, part of it is this comfort factor or dislike of banks more than anything else. But I think mobile is also the missing link if we want to make electronic payments and direct deposit and all of these other trends work. I remember it was about a year ago I was in a store looking at different board games that are available and there are all the different varieties of Monopoly and I didn't know that there was an electronic banking Monopoly where every player has a debit card and you know the, the banker just rings everything up on that and there is no cash. And the more that we're moving away from cash for purposes of safety for purposes of convenience and access. We need new tools because envelope accounting and the other financial education mechanisms that we have haven't necessarily migrated over. So mobile is really a missing piece to making other financial system trends work better for those that really do need uh, a little bit of extra help. Steve? Um, Mobile banking um, <coughs> has great opportunity for underserved and any kind of customer. But at the end of the day, it's still a bank. So you still need to get that customer comfortable with enrolling in a bank account and providing a lot of personal details and, and being validated for their identity and all the things that banks have to do under law and as they should do to make sure that the customer is who they say and all the things that go into it. So uh, that, I think, really is the still going to be the hardest part. Whether or not they access it through a mobile device or a desktop or at a drive through teller, or whatever it might be, uh, it's still fundamental that we have to get people comfortable with saying, hey, here's a, a bank you can use that you can feel comfortable with where your money's safe, but here's an easy way to understand the fees. And money is very cultural. Uh, you bank the way generally your mother and father banked, and they bank generally the way their mothers and fathers banked. And money is a very, depending on the culture, a very inside the house, very, uh, I don't know how to describe it, it's a very intimate discussion with the family, really. It's right up there with religion and uh, and uh, mom's favorite recipes, it's all up there. And uh, uh, you may find that uh, certainly in the Latino community in Los Angeles where we're based and everything else, it's very common. So the biggest issue isn't mobile versus something else. The biggest issue is, hey, banks are okay, they're safe, they're not going to hurt you, and he can understand how to use them. Having said that, there will always be a percentage of people who will never go into any kind of organized governmental institution and provide all that data, that's just the way life works. But to the extent you can get people in the door and make them comfortable with using a bank account to begin with, and then say, hey, look, you don't need to drive to the branch, and now you can do this here, and this is an easy way to uh, pay your sister or move money over here, uh, then it can uh, get m more warmer, if you will, in the consciousness of the likely consumers. And I think what uh, the Reverend said uh, uh, is, is right about that, that getting the word out, I think, is probably eight-tenths of the battle. And I think because uh, capitalism uh, creates um, Lots of companies with great ideas like uh, Josh's companies and so many others. Uh, once the word gets out, people will jump to fill that demand from the customers. But generating that demand, I think, is a big, a big challenge that we all need to work on. Um, I actually think one of the um, um, most promising opportunities is uh, through strategic partnerships with community-based organizations, with historically black colleges and universities, with um, churches with organizations that work with and ha have members are very engaged in the lives of, of the underserved. Um, it's 
through these types of partnerships where um, relationships can be developed that the mobile services platform can actually have its most broad reach and in particular in rural communities and low-income communities where um, bank branches are no longer being built or opened or are being closed down um, I think through those strategic partnerships we do have a real opportunity to bring more people into um, being connected to financial services that are affordable um, and that are safe I guess I'm lucky last. Um, the, the question was about um, how mobile banking can help the underserved. Mm -hmm. um, from, from our perspective, I, I really think most consumers or all consumers are underserved um, with the mobile banking solutions that are on offer today. And I think this speaks to the long history of banks' relationship with technology. Banks have historically and continue <coughs> to underinvest in R&D to adopt new approaches. Um, and I, that's not surprising when as I said in my opening remarks, banks make so much money from customers not understanding what's going on. You know, mobile is about real time. Mobile is about giving you access to information. When you profit from overdraft fees, you have no incentive as a large organization or a large bank to invest in that platform. Um, because we do the opposite, we, we work really hard on making our banking experience uh, you know, mobilely, contextually aware. We work very hard so that when you swipe your card, the transaction appears on your phone within seconds and it's presented with geographic information. Our customers can add photos to those transactions and add memos. And we see massive behavioral change where like I think over a quarter of our transactions, customers have added those photos to. And the reason why we're excited by this is because it presents a very different relationship or a different way to engage with your money than glancing at a statement out of the corner of your eye at the end of each month. People don't like doing that. We see our customers are opening up the mobile app multiple times a day and just browsing through their transactions and snacking on it. They get this situational awareness to, to what's going on. It leads to behavioral change in a way that you don't get by being lectured at or by you know, trying to follow a, an on, uh, you know, a piece of paper. Um, but the thing is, you know, we're unable to do this because of something that uh, the director mentioned. Um, doing things with technology is much lower cost than traditional methods. And one thing I'd really like to see and where I think there's a huge opportunity it's having more companies, more startups, more people innovate in the multitude of different ways that this technology can help people. Yes, we have to comply to the regulations. The regulations are here for a purpose. Um, but as more and more entrants come into the market, I think we'll see millions of new and exciting ways to help you know, the entire segment of the population when it comes to financial services. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much. This has been very valuable. I'd like to invite you to um, join the audience and, um, and hand things to, to back to Zixta who will lead the next part of the session. Thanks, Enya. It's now time to hear from you all, the public. And a number of you have signed up to share some comments and observations about today's discussion. Uh, the open mic portion of today's field hearing is also an opportunity for the CFPB to learn about what's happening in consumer finance markets in the state of Louisiana and throughout your communities. Each person who signed up to provide testimony will have two minutes to do so. And what we hear from you is invaluable. We want to hear from as many of you as possible, so I encourage you to please observe the two-minute limit so that as many folks as signed up to share their observations and comments have the opportunity to ju do just that. Our first public commenter is Mr. Bob Blair. Someone will bring you a microphone. She is right behind you. Thanks, Kale. Bob Blair and I formed a <coughs> corporation called No Truth in Lending. Now that uh, going to be curious to you, but the reason I formed this uh, corporation is that in the Truth in Lending Act of 1968, the method of expressing an annual percentage rate is the simple interest method. <laughs> the mathematically true method is the compound method. My quest is to see this change to the mathematically true compound method. The reason I found this method was wrong. In 1974, while taking a finance course, I found the <coughs> author had used the simple interest method in expressing the 
2% 10 discount as a annual percentage rate. So I wrote him and he said, yes, I was right that it is a compound right, uh, method. He was instrumental, he said, in forming the 1968 uh, formula. And they had used the simple interest method because of the cost of computing. What he meant back in 1968, there were very few computers that had compounding. On a punch card, you had to add a double asterisk to make a compounding. But now, on each one of your phones, you have compounding. So my quest is to see that that uh, is changed. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Stacy Sauce. Hi, thank you for letting me comment today. Um, your discussion of mobile banking was very interesting. I appreciate that service and would like to see it expand and serve low-income communities better. Um, today, I'm here with Together Louisiana. We don't get to see this agency in Louisiana very often, so thank you very much for being here. Um, I was one of hundreds of Louisiana citizens who went to our state legislature during their past session um, several times um, to talk to them about payday lending in Louisiana. I testified in two committees about my family's experience with payday lending. Um, I helped out a family member who <coughs> is low income, lives in an underserved community, and doesn't have a lot of education. He took out a $350 payday loan, and because of the kind of work he does, working in local shipyards and doing landscaping work, somewhat seasonal work, it was hard for him to just go in and pay that back two weeks later. But he went in and paid $55 every two weeks in fees and interest. Um, over many months, he had paid back more than $600. And not one penny of that money had touched the original principal of the loan. And I saw this and I was like, what is going on? How can this possibly be legal? Um, I went and paid the balance, started looking into it more, found out that our state legislature, due to the lobbyists from the payday loan industry, had exempted this industry from our state usury laws and from our state loan sharking laws, which is what shocked me. You know, I thought you couldn't charge this kind of interest and get away with it, but they do, and they're expanding. New payday loan businesses pop up in lots of communities across Louisiana, and it's becoming a bigger problem. Payday lending is the perfect storm of unfair lending practices, and we saw a bipartisan group of our legislators take a stand for real payday lending reform. Early in the session, when legislators were hearing the merits of the issue, there was almost across the board support for reform. And then the payday lending industry hired 55 lobbyists to fight a single reform bill in the Louisiana legislature. To see the influence of money on the political process was truly sickening to me. Legislators who had formerly expressed support began to flip-flop. It was hard for me to have faith in our democratic process. Um, and when this happens in Louisiana and our legislatures refuse to act, I'm hoping that the federal government can step in and do something about this problem. Thank you, Ms. Sauce. Thank you. Claudia Hawkins. I'm Claudia Hawkins, representing Together Louisiana. I, too, was at the legislative session in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm representing the payday lending practices also. And when our legislature failed us also, I'm representing my aunt, who was also caught up in the payday lending scandal, I would say. She frequent the payday lending places and 
she got caught up so bad that she frequent these places about maybe three times a, um, a year maybe and went to maybe five places. And one time she borrowed about $100 and ended up paying $188 back and the interest uh, or maybe the, um, the NSF charges that she paid on this $100 ended up being maybe 280 some dollars back from all the, uh, from the bank. So we petitioned and petitioned the legislative to no avail. So we are here today in front of this panel to see what we can do down here in New Orleans today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Hawkins. Edgar Cage. Uh, thank you, and thank you for coming. My name is Edgar Cage. I'm also with Together Louisiana. I was at the state legislature every day this past session trying to work and lobby for the citizens of Louisiana against the payday loan industry. And I just want to thank you guys for coming. And I like your opening statements when you said you're about the state and federal governments working together for fairness and transparency, protecting citizens in finance and community-related areas. I like that. But what's the problem here is when the state fails, we need the federal government to step in. We need you guys to step in. This reminds me, you can tell by my appearance, of the civil rights struggles that we had back in the 60s. When the states failed to do what was right, to do what was fair for the citizens according to the constitutions, the federal government had to step in and make laws. And that's what we need. That's what we're demanding now. Because not only Louisiana, you have people all over this country, all over this country, who are affected by this payday loan industry. The um, Latino lady was talking about uh, a cycle of tricks and traps. That's what they do. And talking about English proficiency. Well, if a person does not have economic proficiency, doesn't mean they should be exploited. So we need the CFBP. We need the federal government to come in and do the work that the state failed to do. So we're asking you to help us in Louisiana and others across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cage. <laughs> Charles Barnes. Afternoon, everyone. Hi, Charlie Barnes. Uh, I am community manager of Gotta Use It. Gotta Use It, Inc. is a, a local New Orleans-based digital media template design firm. Now, currently, uh, myself and my team are in development of a uh, template a, or, if you would, recipe for an online application uh, that enables communities to make better financial, uh, to enable their neighbors to make better financial decisions. So what this, uh, uh, pro so what this particular project does is it uh, is a license to a recipe that builds an application that enables the community to, to map uh, each and every single ATM, bank branch, and local credit union within their communities and on, an, on a separate screen, list them from uh, cheapest to costliest, with, of course, all the payday uh, lending services and check cash encounters listed at the bottom. Uh, uh, the idea, uh, the assumption behind this uh, particular project is that uh, people face barriers uh, to, pr uh, to uh, healthy uh, financial uh, decisions, uh, whether be they practical or, in most cases, emotional, uh, fear-based, uh, 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 fear-based, uh, emotional-based, or, uh, or based on this. Uh, this uh, particular application replaces those uh, particular barriers people face with the simple fact of where the cheapest credit union or bank is located within their communities. If uh, any of you all would like any more information about what me and my team are developing, and if you'd like to, uh, so you could tell us uh, what you would like to see out of this particular project we're all working on, please come see me at the conclusion of the, uh, of the public uh, uh of the uh, public comment section of this hearing, and I'll be uh, happy to answer your questions and uh, receive your feedback. Thank you very much. My team would be delighted to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. Diane Henley. Thank you again for coming and for listening. One of the things that I do is I go to churches, and I talk and ask people about the issues that are important to them. 
And in it, the issue of payday kept coming up so much that I started to just ask about payday. And I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of people in dire straits how easily they got preyed upon and got caught up in this trap. And so I learned how payday worked. It's a type of loan sharking. In our state, loan sharking is illegal, punishable of $10,000 fine up to one to five years in prison. That's when you charge 45% interest. It's illegal unless you own a payday establishment. Then you can charge up to 700% in our state. I've brought all that I know about this industry to our state legislature. I testified before committee after committee. I've written letters explaining that I have personal proof about these practices because a family member was left homeless with his wife and his two children because of these practices. How did the state legislators respond when I talked to them? They went with the industry. So I'm here today to take this to the federal level. If the state leaders will not listen, then the responsibility comes to you. And I am so glad that you are here. You know the devastation of this industry. I learned yesterday that you have analyzed over 12 million payday loans. So you know the devastation on Americans. Please do not respond like our legislators did. Do not let the industry dictate the way that legislation and regulation should go. We saw time and again legislation put forth by the industry that did nothing to address the real issue of the debt trap the true cause of people's suffering. We can't afford half measures. I heard, heard Ms. Martinez say, and I was glad to hear her say, we're about making rules more effective. You know the problem better than anyone. And so I join with others in calling on making more effective rules. And we recommend three things. They are needed for effective regulation. Address the debt trap, assure affordability of loans, and require reporting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hanley. <laughs> Marie Brown. I'm Marie Brown uh, from Monroe, North Louisiana. We're here today to stand together with friends from across the state as part of Together Louisiana. We are very concerned about protecting people from the predatory practices of payday lending that affects 50,000 uh, Louisiana households annually. We need a way to protect our citizens from the debt trap of payday lenders. Uh, my sister also was in the payday lending trap. And when I went, as the other lady spoke, to pay them off, I had to go through so many hangups, so many, I need to speak to your manager, uh, and I'm trying to give them money to pay that loan off, and I was not successful in trying to pay that loan off for her. I come to be the voice of people that could not come today because they were trapped in payday lending. I came to give up two paydays by coming to Baton Rouge yesterday and today. So if anybody else that's coming to speak for payday lending, give up your payday as I'm giving up my paydays to come and speak against payday lending. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Elder Chips Taylor. Thank you for coming, first of all. I just want to address two quick points, if I may. First of all, payday lending, we all agree that it is a serious problem that exists in our state. I've always found, though, that when you have a problem, you need to look at solutions. The reason why payday lending is so relevant and so easy access is because the people that go after the payday loans are people that need money. They do not qualify for most of your financial institutions. They cannot go to an, a bank, uh, a credit union, and qualify for a loan, so therefore they, they have feel they have no choice but to go to payday lenders or someone of that nature to get the money. I believe one of the solutions to that would be if we can have some of our financial institutions set up programs that would cater to the low-income individuals, understanding that they have a problem with the loan, with, uh, understand their income is of uh, such a level, so therefore make payments accessible. That's why payday loan is so easy. 
They tell them, look, you come back, you pay $50 in a month, you know, you pay another $50. So, okay, they don't think in their mind that they're paying 700% interest. They think they're paying $50. So if, if you have a problem like this, then we need to find a solution. The solution lies with our banks and other financial institutions. My second point I want to deal with is your mobile banking. Uh, as a member of the Full Gospel, our new uh, uh, director or our new bishop-elect, Joseph Walker out of Nashville, has one of the largest churches in the fellowship. He has over 25,000 members. Last year, Bishop Walker did $1.5 million in offerings and tithes just on the internet, just through communication like that. We're not talking about people that came to the church and paid. We're talking about young people who don't know how to write a check, who've never written a check, that don't need to write a check. So therefore, they use their smartphones. They need, they use this. This is how they pay their tithe. This is how they pay their offerings. Just like uh, you know, Brother Gable said, we in the faith-based community need to definitely be informed of this and educated on how easy this is to do and the, 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 the availability. So I think that, again, there needs to be some type of training, some type of education that is geared not only towards the business community, but your faith-based community as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chips Taylor. Reverend Priscilla Momus. I'm, uh, I'm Deacon Priscilla Momus. I'm the Archdeacon of the Episcopal Diocese of Louisiana. And I'm here not only representing myself, but also the Archdeacon of the West uh, Diocese of uh, Western Louisiana. Uh, both of our bishops are very interested in seeing payday lending reform. I know our bishop was bitterly disappointed at the actions of our legislature, which did not, in fact, uh, passed meaningful reform. The only reform they passed actually benefited the brick and mortar payday industry here. Uh, it was more against mobile uh, applications. Um, we have decided that uh, we will continue to try to work with the legislature, but I have formed a task force of five deacons that are from around the state, and we are uh, going to be working with community partners, and we decided that uh, the citizen action having failed that we will turn to that other great American uh, principle of competition and that we will uh, help uh, communities develop awareness, and Mr. Barnes, I'd love to talk to you, about um, other products available in their community and the impact of those products versus the impact of predatory lending. Um, and we also would like to work with organizations in getting out the word and financial literacy training to neighborhood associations and churches, um, and also uh, the word of how our legislators have acted uh, and how they intend to act. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Momus. That concludes the audience participation portion of today's field hearing. I want to thank every one of you for the very warm welcome that you all have extended to the CFPB. It's been a truly insightful experience for us. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. We know you have more important things to do, but we greatly appreciate that you took the time to make sure we're educated about what's happening in Louisiana. I also want to thank all those who joined via live stream at consumerfinance.gov. That concludes today's field hearing at the old US Mint in New Orleans, Louisiana. Have a great afternoon.